Is the GPU that Lisa held in her hand the Big Navi? Were the benchmarks she showed from the Big Navi? Or was it a slightly cut down version? Is AMD sandbagging? Or are they level setting expectations? Let's get into it. Before we start, if you like this content, please like or dislike and comment below. Something has really changed with YouTube. My videos are not getting recommended and I am trying to figure out if my content is relevant or if it needs to change. And your feedback would be immensely helpful, so thank you in advance. Now, let's get into it. AMD showed three benchmark numbers for three games to demonstrate that they are ready with 4K gaming at 60 frames per second. In a tweet by Planet3D and run at video cards, they showed comparisons to Borderlands 3 and Gears 5 at the same settings against the RTX 3080 and found it to be tied with Borderlands 3 at 61 frames per second and 10% behind in Gears 5. Now in a post on Reddit, there was a discovery of Navi information found in the GPU drivers in Mac OS 11 beta, and it describes several Navi GPUs, and more specifically, Navi 21, which is the largest die variant. They discovered that in going through the power play tables, that there is a Navi 21A and a Navi 21B, both having 80 compute units. The differences are that the Navi 21A has a max clock speed of 2050 megahertz with 200 watts of GPU power, while Navi 21B has a max clock speed of 2200 megahertz with 238 watts of power. Keep in mind this is the GPU chip power and not the total board power. I could see the Navi 21B GPU at 300 watts or more. So the question is, are the benchmarks Lisa showed from Navi 21A or Navi 21B? Let's explore the two options. What if the benchmarks AMD showed are of Navi 21B at 2200 megahertz? That it provides similar performance in some games to the RTX 3080, but may trail by up to 10% in others. Its saving grace may be the 2200 megahertz frequency would allow higher frame rates at 1440p and 1080p, and may be a better option for those who need the higher frame rates. But at 4K, NVIDIA's flagship, the 3080, would be the top dog. I'm excluding the 3090 due to its price and its target for 8K gaming. NVIDIA wins and Big Navi comes up short, but if they price it competitively, then this could be a great option. What if the benchmarks are of Navi 21A at 2050 MHz? Again, it would provide similar performance to the RTX 3080, but may trail by up to 10% in some games. With slightly higher clock speeds at 2050 MHz, it would have slightly better performance for higher frame rates at 1440p and 1080p. But it would mean what Lisa showed is not THE Big Navi. That would mean that THE Big Navi is Navi 21B, with its 2200 MHz clock speed that could provide up to a 7% better performance. In other words, it would trade blows with the 3080, which would mean that most people would decide based on price, features, and availability. Much of the sentiment around the internet I've seen so far seems to conclude that in the end, the 3080 does not lose the crown to Big Navi. So which one is it? Well, what if Navi 21A is not only cut down in frequency versus Navi 21B? You see, most of the discussion assumes that both Navi 21A and Navi 21B have 80 compute units since that is what is in the macOS beta drivers. I think that part is true. What no one is talking about is what if Navi 21A, while having 80 compute units, only has 72 of them active. Just like the table shows a Navi 10 with 40 compute units, the power play tables also show a Navi 10A and a Navi 10B. It is well known that macOS supports all versions of Navi 10 that have 40 compute units in the 5700 XT and 36 compute units in the 5700. I covered in my last video how AMD has a history of releasing two cards using the same die size with one having fewer compute units active and running at lower frequencies. This is part of their playbook. They do this to improve overall yields and offer a more affordable version by creating another lower tier segment. So what if AMD showed the results from a 72 compute unit Navi 21A running at 2050 megahertz? This would mean that the 72 compute units is on par with or only slightly behind the 3080's 68 SMs at similar frequencies. This seems to be very reasonable since the RDNA 1 architecture performed very well against Turing and the jump from Turing to Ampere was very good but not beyond reach for RDNA 2. 
So what would that mean for the big Navi with 80 compute units active and running up to 2200 megahertz? Well, that is 11% more compute units and 7% higher clocks. So we can expect the big Navi to have higher performance than the 3080, but fall short of the 3090, which has 82 SMs. However, with its higher frequency, I think it beats both of them at 1440p and 1080p, making it the high frame rate king for everything under 4K gaming. Rumors have suggested AMD could offer an even higher clocked version that is liquid cooled, and AMD has done this many times before, but could that beat the 3090? From experience, I know that increasing performance with clock speeds becomes very limited beyond certain frequencies due to the memory latency issues and then the power and temperature issues that follow. To show this, I did some performance scaling between AMD's last three high-end flagships in the Radeon 7, Vega, and Fury. Starting with Fury, I did a sweep of performance in Time Spy versus the clock frequency. I then plotted the GPU power at each frequency point. From the chart, you can see that the performance rise versus the frequency starts to decrease at about 950 MHz. So as you increase the frequency, the performance gains are slowing down. Also from the chart, you can see that the GPU power now starts to greatly increase after 900 MHz to where it is now consuming much more power for lesser gains in performance. This is something that is well understood for most enthusiasts. However, I thought it would be nice to demonstrate this in a chart. Moving on to Vega, I map my Vega 56 GPU the same way and you start to see a subtle shift in the decrease in performance at 1600 MHz. I could not go beyond this point without this old and worn out GPU giving me the black screen. However, performance would start decreasing above this point. The highlight is how the power starts to take off at 1400 MHz and greatly rise beyond this point. With the Radeon 7, which is nothing more than a 7 nanometer Vega, you see the performance is steady to 1900 MHz. This card would also not complete Time Spy at 2000 MHz and would black screen. I guess I didn't win the Silicon Lottery on this card. However, for the GPU power, you can clearly see the GPU inflection beyond 1600 MHz. That inflection point is 200 MHz higher than Vega and is due to the process node moving from 14 nanometers to 7 nanometers. Finally, with my RX 5700 XT Red Devil, you can see that going above 2000 MHz, it just hits a wall. The performance completely leveled off and power started to skyrocket. This is why you don't see many people talking about overclocking the RX 5700 XT like they did with previous generation cards. For RDNA 2 to do better, it will have to move that power curve further to the right. With the PlayStation 5 running up to 2.23 GHz, and the power play table suggesting up to 2.2 GHz for the largest die in Navi 21B, I am expecting the inflection point at just over 2.2 GHz. That would mean above this, limited performance improvements for much higher GPU power levels and the need for liquid cooling. If the performance scaling on the large die, RDNA 2 does not get better than the 3090, then I don't think AMD will release it. But if they get better performance, even single digit better, they could release it and maybe call it the RX 6950 XT. Of course, it will cost stupid amounts of money, like $14.99, for a small incremental increase in performance. And if they did, it would likely come early next year. We know Nvidia is set to release a 3080 with 20 gigabytes of VRAM and a 3070 with 16 gigabytes in December as a response to AMD's RX 6000 series. Since the 3080s aren't available anyways, I'm just going to wait. Also, a report from Digitimes claims NVIDIA is looking to upgrade their Ampere GPUs from Samsung's 8 nanometer to TSMC's 7 nanometer. We know with Samsung's 8 nanometer, they have no headroom to increase performance, and they will have to move to a more efficient node like TSMC to go faster. For me, it is also a bit of an admission that they made the wrong move going to Samsung. I mentioned in my video last March that NVIDIA moving to Samsung's 8 nanometer node was not trivial and could open the door for AMD to take the GPU crown. With an 80 compute unit Big Navi running at 2.2 GHz, I think they could have the title and NVIDIA won't be able to respond until next year. Let me know in the comments below. Do you think Lisa showed a 72 compute unit version or the 80 compute unit version? And I wanted to touch on a question that I have been asked several times since my last video, and that is with respect to AMD's Zen 3 announcement. The question is,
do I need to upgrade my CPU if I purchase a 3080 or a big Navi? So I dug a little deeper into the details in AMD's presentation. And even though they showed 10 games in the chart comparing the 5900X versus Intel's 10900K, the footnote shows testing of 11 popular titles. So they chose to show 10 out of the 11 tested. But that's not the interesting point. Just under that footnote is another one where they tested 40 PC games at 1080p high settings between the 5900X and the 10900K. That means there are 30 other games in which they did not show the results. I suspect that the results of the 30 other games are similar or even less impressive than the results of the 10 they did show. To me it says that AMD will take the performance lead in most games. AMD will win more than they lose and will take the performance crown from Intel. However, as I showed in the last video, the 10 games are, on average, 6.8% better at 1080p. The 6.8% better is good, but it will not be very noticeable in gameplay unless you're constantly looking at frame rates. At 4K resolution, there won't be any advantage. Getting back to the question, if you have one of the following six Intel CPUs, like the Intel 10th generation 10900K, 10700K, or 10600K, the 9th generation 9900K or 9700K, and even the 8th gen i7-8700K, you don't have to upgrade, and you could wait until next year for Rocket Lake, Alder Lake, or better yet, Zen 4. Gaming at 4K using Zen 1 or Zen 2 should be fine, and for the split on Intel's non-hyper-threaded CPUs and older 4-core 8-thread CPUs, it remains to be seen. I hope to do some testing to find out for sure. However, if you want frame rates at all costs, then upgrading to Zen 3 will ensure your CPU is getting the most out of your brand new graphics cards. Like it if you learned something, please share it, that really helps the channel. Subscribe for more. Thank you all so very much for watching, stay safe out there, and I will see you in the next one.